Mandy Patinkin is a Broadway legend and on-screen icon. Known for his performances in Evita, Sunny in the Park with George, Homeland, The Princess Bride, and so many more, he has also received praise for his evocative concert performances. Now, he's hitting the road to promote his latest album, Children and Art. Hear about the first time Stephen Sondheim played him finishing The Hat, his favorite line from The Princess Bride, and more on this week's Show People. Mandy, so happy you're here. Good to be here. You know, I actually, I have to admit, I interview a lot of people, but I woke up today with like a real like pep in my step knowing you were coming in. Oh, bless you. I'm I'm a little bit of a super fan and and just thrilled you're here. Thank you. And thrilled that you are making music. Yes. This is a brand new, just just released album on Nunsuch. You've had a great run with Nunsuch Records, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love them. And Bob Hurwitz, who formed the company, dear friend. And he put me together with Thomas Bartlett, who brought me into a whole new world of music. And that is what this is mainly. uh, Yeah, Paul Ford, great piano man, music man, uh, was your collaborator for many years. 30 plus years. On stage with you. performing great yeah. collaboration i guess yeah. he retired i wasn't sure what to do and then i was my i was shooting homeland at that time and and uh trying to do both at the same time then homeland got really intense schedule got crazy and i just thought okay maybe i'm not supposed to do it so i paul left and so i let it rest and i went two or three years and i was just dying i just felt like i'm so you know, was i by the way oh, as a fan of your oh, music bless you. <laughs> and and i i i missed it i missed it like oxygen or you know, something you need to be alive. And my dear friend Bob Hurwood said, I want you to meet this kid. And a young man, gifted man named Thomas Bartlett, I go over to him, and he did not know a single Broadway show tune. Amazing. At, at one point I said to him, do you know, because I like to put different sounds together when we're making music, and right. I said, well, can you can you put something of, of like a baseball, like, you know, take me out to the ball game. How does that go, he said. <laughs> I, and he was dead serious. And then later on at some point I said, Thomas, um, you know the theme, uh, that uh, the Disney thing, you know, no, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star? No. Let me look it up on YouTube. <laughs> and he does. He goes, we go to yeah, YouTube. Yeah, sure. And we listen to it. And so he was a singer-songwriter guy, which I had done some of that, Harry yeah. Chapin, Paul Simon, yes. you know, different things, but not to this extent. And he's got people that aren't even out there yet bringing him songs, working on new music that he feeds to me, like Teicher and other people. So we set out, and he sent me 300 songs to listen to. Wow on uh, Christmas Eve, and then we went into the studio and we created, I said, let me just make a diary like people make a journal. Yeah. Let's hit the record button, whenever we have 10 or 11, we'll put them out there. But not in a record proper form, just in, just digitally run them out there like yeah. every, everything's flying around in the air. And so then Bob wanted to put out a proper CD, which then you have, you know, it needs to have a tour and everything else. And, and so he, he and I and Thomas chose, I think, 11, 10 or 11 songs and tell a kind of, you know, not literal, but figurative tale that I like to do when I put material together. And uh, and then we added something from uh, an album long ago, and um, and that's it. So the tour is, is, is the heart of this new yes. music. And for instance, there's, well, there are things that are on the record that aren't in the tour, and things that are in the tour that aren't on the record. So I'll definitely have to come see the tour. You're oh, doing, please. You're doing 30 cities. 30, you're in the, the midst of a 30-city tour. 30 city, I think it's 30 concerts, 30 cities, give or take one, because some were doing two. I love Some that. So, yeah. I've loved your stage performances, loved your movies, loved your TV work, mm-hmm. but there's something about a Mandy Patinkin album, just listening to your voice. It's so distinctive. It's so emotional. You said that you sort of first heard emotion in music in synagogue. synagogue is that, is yeah. that right? Yeah, I was there from the time I was a little boy. I was in the boys' choir at seven years old, and I remember the uh, men my age or younger than me at this point, but they would be praying, and I would hear those sounds, and I'd hear the cantor and that cry in the voice. And yeah. Uh, and I heard it every day, you know, yeah. and, and I, and so clearly that's in me. And I love because I found you because of Broadway, because of your, your work in Abita, which was iconic. You and Patti Lapone fell in love with both of you. My dear friend. From the minute I got that vinyl. We have a fun idea for a new piece. Oh, well, we're going to talk about that. Which because I can't wait to uh, oh, get, well, you, you know, know when you, have, you both of us have time to give it birth, which I have time now. She's finishing up a thing, a couple things. Finishing, yeah, she's about to launch a big thing on Broadway. She's doing a TV series right now, then she's yes. doing a Broadway show. Hollywood and So we, you know, we'll sneak it in there. Yeah, you <laughs> promised last time you were here with her that you were doing another show together. So yeah, I was yeah, going to yeah, hold we, you to that. And yeah, I'm this glad was that her idea, this new one. Okay. Yeah, so okay. I'm excited about it. But what I wanted to say is I, I found you because of Broadway, but then you have actually introduced me to so much music mm. because of, of your albums. Because I started listening to your albums and, and you have 
you know, like uh, Taxi, the Harry Chapin mm. song, is like one of my favorite things you've yeah. recorded. I would have never known that song without yeah. you. And in the new album, some of the, so many great songwriters on the new album, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Laurie Anderson, what a, what a yeah, great yeah. Laurie Anderson piece. And when I heard those words, that story that she told, long time ago she wrote that. I thought, did you write that this morning, Laurie? Right. And it was like stunning to right. me, the timelessness yeah. of it. Taxi was amazing that you mentioned that because I was in the first midnight special on I, whatever yeah. I think it was ABC. Yeah. And I was doing a commercial for 7-Up when I was a kid. Wow. And I had the, um, uh, the leather jacket and everything, and I was a ghost for 7-Up. I'll tell you a funny story, though, with Broadway and everything uh -huh. that maybe a lot of people don't know. I have never discussed something. Okay. I don't think I have. Forgive me, maybe Exclusive. I have. Exclusive. I'm at the age where if I make a mistake, it's okay. It's all right. So um, I did a show in Chicago while I was still in high school at the Candlelight Dinner Playhouse. You okay. know, where you eat dinner and, the, and yep. the table goes and the floor goes down, the show comes up out of right. the floor. <laughs> and it was called uh, Jimmy Shine. And there was this young guy in it. And he'd come backstage and he'd play these songs on this ratty guitar, no case or anything. Listen to this, listen to this. He'd play bum, 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 And I, yeah, yeah. And then i go away to college to be a freshman at the University of Kansas. Right. He said, Mandy, you know that stole songs I was playing for you? He's, I said, yeah. He said, uh, uh, we're going to do it on, in Chicago in such and such a place, and I want you to play the lead. I said, well, I can't. I'm going to college. I'm, I'm, my parents will kill me. I've got to do this. Okay, okay. I understand. And then time goes by. I finished the first year of college. Second year, the show's a success in Chicago. I didn't even know about it because I was in okay. school. And because he, he says, we're doing the show on Broadway, and I'd, I'd love you to come and play the lead. And I said, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, dude, I'm in college. And it ended up that every single person in my generation, almost that I know, was in that show, except for me. And I'm the first guy he asked to be in it. And the show was called Grease. You would have been in Grease? And he asked me to play Danny Zuko. Danny Zuko? Yeah. And I was uh, <laughs> six, 17 years old. 17 when he asked me to do the Chicago one. And then I came to New York to be at Juilliard and go to the drama school there. And he called again and said, we're doing, can you do it? And I can't. I, I just started this school. Wow. And, and, and all my friends were in it or in the road uh -huh. company or in the movie. I'm right. the only guy that was never yeah. in a production yeah. of the darn thing. What could and then done? I've seen Jimmy Jacobs. Jimmy Jacobs was the guy. Yeah, yeah, who was of in, course. Who yeah. was in Jimmy Shine. Yeah. And I've seen him over the years, and we get a big kick out of it. That's amazing. Amazing. You could have been someone. I could have been somebody, <laughs> yeah. So your tour, do you get excited about going out on the road? Is, oh, is, I am I mean, very excited. You're playing right a lot now. of great venues all around the country. I love it more than anything I do. People are so kind that you've come to see them. I love doing this stuff. The music makes me just alive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've had a wonderful job in Homeland, but it's a very dark tale, yeah. very intense. The polar opposite in every imaginable way of this music. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I would get through Homeland by, on my days off, take walks and run my music. Because yeah. I got like 10 hours, and to not lose it, I just do it while I'm walking. Yeah. And so if you ever see me walking mumbling, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> and, um, and so I can't wait. I've been, I'm, I'm chomping at the bit. Yeah, seeing you in concert is a, a once-in-a-lifetime experience. So everyone out there, if many of is coming anywhere near you, make sure you get your tickets. I'm going to be a groupie. I'm going to follow you around. Oh, yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll get you in. <laughs> All right, we have a lot more to talk about. We're going to take a quick sure. break. We'll be right back with more Mandy Patinkin. back with Mandy Patinkin. Mandel. Mandy? Mandel yeah. Bruce Patinkin. Mandel Bruce Patinkin. Mandel, a German Yiddish word, Hebrew German Yiddish, meaning almond. Oh. Therefore, my parents named me after a nut. <laughs> Genius. <laughs> and I feel I've lived up to that. <laughs> but were you always called Mandy as a kid? Mandy from day okay, one. Always Mandy. Yeah, they felt Mandel was uh, just too old sounding a name to yeah. call a baby. And my grandfather was named Max. His Hebrew right. Yiddish name was Menachem Mendel. Okay. So they took the Mendel and made it Mandel. Okay. And they felt Max was too old. You know, and then in my kid's generation, every kid was named Max. Right. And so you grew up in Chicago. Mm -hmm. and, uh, where South you side of Chicago. Could have been Danny Zuko, but that didn't work out. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and your dad died when you were a teen. Yeah, yeah. I was, uh, I think I was 17 or 18. I can't remember exactly. Uh -huh. Were you already into performing by then? Yes. Had he seen you perform and yes, sing? Yes, he had. He had seen me perform, 
and he knew that I got into Juilliard. Oh, okay. Uh, the drama school. And, uh, and the last thing he ever saw me do was he came in a wheelchair uh, with pancreatic cancer to the University of Kansas, played Tevya and Fiddler on the Roof. I've always wanted to see you play Tevya and Fiddler on yeah, the Roof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad your dad got to. Yeah, he got to see that. Wow. He would always say, Mandy, sing if I were a rich man. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> he loved it. I also did it in Hebrew at Camp Sura wow. in Buchanan, Michigan. In 1967. Did you glue on the beard? Uh, indeed. Because the beard lives on you now. Indeed, I glued that beard glued, on. Glued that beard. <laughs> yes, I glued it on. Amazing. Yeah. I didn't get facial hair till a long till later. And did you grow this for Homeland? I've grown beards on and off right. over time. But uh, it's now it's the Homeland guys uh, a a absolutely asked me if I would consider it. And I said, sure, and I was doing a play at the time okay. and, and jockeying from New York dress rehearsals to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina to shoot the pilot. The minute the pilot was finished, I shaved the beard for the play. Okay. And then the pilot got picked up to do it, and, uh, and everybody said, we love the beard, let's go. But you've now wrapped on Homeland, and you still have the beard. Yeah, I have the beard. Um, I'm not sure why I haven't shaved it. <laughs> I, you know, we have the album coming out, all the artwork had the beard right, photos, right. Um, the artwork for the concert has the beard. I don't have a good answer. I don't know. I'll shave it for if you, you know, if I need to shave it right. for something. Right. I like both versions. So, okay, so whatever works. Thank you. Thank whatever you. works. So you I've lost enough hair on my head that I've, I would keep it on my count face. Counters, okay. <laughs> Connery, yeah. You did Carousel as a kid too, right? Yes, By the I way, did. Your, a soliloquy is another great Mandy Patinkin recording. Oh, I, I've lived with that soliloquy a lot too. Oh, God. <laughs> well, Carousel was actually the moment that uh, that rehearsal on the south side of Chicago at the Young Men's Jewish Council Youth right. Center, where I went after school, was the number that, that triggered me into saying, I'm going to try to do this. What happened was Bob Condor, who ran a costume house mm -hmm. in Chicago, uh, he um, was the director. And Bob sat us down yep. in that semicircle in the same room I went to nursery school in. And he said, what's this play about? Right. And all kids raise their hands about a guy who makes a mistake, about a guy who gets a second chance, about a guy, about a guy, about right. a guy. And Bob says, like a good teacher, I think it's about all those things. And he said, but I also think it's about something else. I think it's about if you love someone, tell them. Mm. And at that moment, I'd had wonderful parents. I'd heard the rabbi make many wonderful sermons. I just, I never connected with anything quite so simple. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, I said, wow, if this thing called theater has that kind of language, mm -hmm. I'm going to mm -hmm. hang out and see what it is. Mm -hmm. And that was the moment where I thought, I'm going for it. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about Catherine, speaking of love. Yeah, yeah. You'll be celebrating for 40 years. 40 years, yeah. Next, next year, next June. Well, we consider yeah. April 18th our official anniversary. April 18th was the first date, oh. and that's when I asked her to marry me. And she said, you don't know what you're talking about. You're an actor and a baby, and you're going to get on, hurt. On your first date? I asked her first date to marry me. Very Mandy Patinkin. Yeah, so yeah. You, you just sat down, you said, this is the one. Yeah, yeah. We're and I get... brought her yellow button mums, uh, which cost me a buck on the, you know, when I got off the subway. And I always tell people, because I, I, I usually bring, sometimes I have flowers or bring flowers out on stage. And I always try to have those button mums if I can. And I tell people, pick a cheap flower, because if it works, you want to be able to afford whatever you bought over the uh -huh. years, you know? <laughs> and so, so that was it. And uh, I kissed her on the corner of the Black Sheep Tavern at Washington and uh, whatever the cross street was in the village. And an old African-American gentleman said, while we were kissing, broke the kiss and said, love, isn't it wonderful? Oh, my God. And that was our guardian angel, that That's man. That's beautiful. Yeah. I love her dearly. She is my muse, my inspiration, my soul, the guide to my children's beings. Uh, yeah. And uh, all three children being, being the third in the house. <laughs> She's a, a mom to three. She is. She is the mom to us all. Yeah. And Isaac and Gideon. Isaac and Gideon, and yeah. And how are they? They're great. They're out there living life. I, I feel like what I know about you is you love being a dad and you love being a father. I do. You're very open about your relationship with both your boys. I think it was Isaac said that you, you cried a lot when they were kids. I cry all the time. Dad, dad cried all the time yeah, and, yeah. and they were kind of like, and you were very emotional and you've actually talked about how sort of like they would go see you in a performance and think you were fantastic and then they would see you crying about how horrible you were in a performance. Oh, yeah. Well, my, my flaw in life, which I've gotten much better at uh -huh. and why I'm so glad I, I'm still alive, is um, 
I tried to be a perfectionist, and yeah. I was too hard on myself and beat myself up at times. And it was confusing to my sons, because like you said, they would see what they thought daddy doing a good job, and then daddy being unhappy. But yeah. it was a terrible message to give your children, terrible message to give me. And uh, I'll never forget something that I struggled with my whole life, and I'm finally getting it. Mm. But I work at it every day. Larry McMurtry, who a great writer wrote yeah. Lonesome Dove, I was about to go do um, a job, and he had written one of the scripts for this job, okay. uh, among many other people. And he said, uh, talking about the individual who was involved with the job, he said, you know, this person uh, is a perfectionist, and they can't get it through their head. It's the only thing in life that you can't attain, perfection. And I heard that as a young man, and I've spent my whole life trying to, you know, get that into my DNA, because it couldn't be truer. Yeah. And so now my mantra is, it was good enough. I did the best I could. It was good enough. Move on, as Steve mm -hmm. Sondheim and James Lapine wrote. Move on. We're going to move on to a commercial break. Okay. <laughs> we have a lot more with Mandy Patinkin after this break. We're back with Mandy Patinkin. You've done so many great things in your career. I could have you for hours talking about minutia of every one of them, but we won't. We don't have time. But you did this uh, movie people really like, of many, but you did a movie called The Princess Bride, right? People, yes. And this is a thing people bring up often with you. Yes, they and do. And the line, and they want you to do the line. The lady and her little boy brought it up on the subway this morning as I was See? on my way down here. <laughs> and do they, do they say the line It was a two-year-old little boy, and I said, you, he watched The Princess Bride? And she said, yeah. I said, isn't he a little young for that? Oh, no, he got it. He loved it all, she said. <laughs> Is it okay? Kids these days. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they make you say the line. They often like me to say the line. You Some kids a... don't believe their parents that I'm the guy. And then I'll whisper it in their ear. And uh, my wife sometimes is there. She says, you should just see their faces. Just trying, oh. to, trying to understand what's happening. You know? <laughs> the guy. And then I'll whisper it in grown-ups' ears, too. Because uh. it became this whole thing for generations. And, and so... So, so that I don't throw them <laughs> by how I look now. Yeah. I whispered in their ear and we're, they're kind of home. Right, and you played a guy named, just, just give me a little piece of it. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father, prepare to die. Thank you so much. But no one ever asks about my favorite line in the film, well, oh. which William Goldman wrote, God bless his soul. It's right toward the end of the film, and I just think it's one of the great gifts of all of his writings. You know? I have been in the revenge business so long. Now that it's over, I do not know what to do with the rest of my life. <laughs> That's fantastic. And I never understood or paid attention to that line when I said it on film as a young man. Yeah. And it was when I was doing the first evening with Patti Lapone, and we were in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And I was at the gym working out, and it was on the TV, and I, the sound wasn't on. I went up to have dinner, and my wife was, had it on. And then I saw that, and I was 50-something. And I went, wow, I missed that. Mm. I love how you embrace the, the fandom of, of these little things. I mean, there's no reason to fight it, right? I mean, people know you for whatever they know you for. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited. It's great to be known. I've had for anything. You know, <laughs> I remember in, we lived in a building on, uh, on 90th Street for 28 years. People would put things under the door. Some horrible things that sometimes would be written in the paper. They're just so excited you're in the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> They don't care what it is. Nobody. And, uh, why would somebody put that under? Because they think it's great. <laughs> so, it's, That's you know, amazing. It's, it's uh, and you know they're making a musical of it. Finally, it's one of those movies that people have really wanted. Disney is finally developing a musical. Of the Princess yeah, Bride. that's what I heard. I mean, there were other moments when it had been yeah. in development as well. There was a fun thing. Uh, I remember Adam Gettle was doing a version once with William Goldman, uh -huh. and someone told me that their plan was to ask me if I would play the grandfather, ah. and then I would become Inigo Montoya ah. uh, as the grandfather, you know, sort of an older <laughs> version. Or something. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure how that would have worked, but, um, but it was just fun. But, uh, yeah. it was, you know, to be in this thing that's sort of a Wizard of Oz of my generation, several generations, yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, even when you ask me about it, I can never get over that, yeah, I'm, I, I got to be in it. Yeah. I'm, I'm, you, you're talking about me. I, I'm in it. That's, yeah. I can't get over it. I have another question of something I really care deeply about. I love the Sondheim song, What Can You Lose, mm. from Dick Tracy, that you sing with Madonna. Yeah. I, I love that song. I think it's yeah. such a beautiful little song. 
And you're in the movie. You're, you're the piano player. Which 88 is Keys. Right, right, of course. Was that originally more of a moment? You put so much emotion into it, and it's such a beautiful little moment in that movie. Yeah. But that was Warren Beatty's gift to me. What happened was I had been I had just birthed my concerts at the Public Theater okay. while I was doing Leontes in the Winter's Tale that Lapine had right. directed. Uh -huh. At the same time, I went to do uh, Dick Tracy to film it. Uh, but Warren called me to film it, and before so I'd been and I'd been working on the concert, the very first concert, nineteen eighty eight, right. nineteen eighty yeah. nine ever for a whole year. I hadn't worked for a long time. I did a Shakespeare play at the Public Theater. I, I wasn't making any money. So I called all my friends up and I said, can I do anything in your movies? You know, like just so I can pay the rent and, uh -huh. and get my medical insurance, you know, so right. I'll, 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 I'll serve people drinks. I don't care what it is. And, uh, and Warren said, let me get back to you. And he calls me up and he says, yeah, and I just spoke to Steve and he's going to write you a song. Wow. And that's how it happened. Wow. And were you in a recording studio with Madonna? Yeah, yeah. We were in the recording studio. We recorded. Then also we did it live on stage, but in the end it was the recording studio version that yeah. uh, was used. Yeah, it's a beautiful song. I know. I know. It's I, well, there's nothing that he writes that I'm not a fan of. Yeah, he's really sort of been this beautiful thread throughout your career. Yeah, I, I can't, you know, I always wondered as a young actor, what was it like being part of Shakespeare's company? Well, you know, one of those people. Mm. And then one day I went, what do you mean, what was it like? You know Steve Sondheim, you work with Steve Sondheim. Right. That's what it's like. Yeah. You know, a great artist. And, and I would say, Stephen, like a few others that I've worked with, the great artists, the really greats, are completely open. Mm. They want to know what you think and feel. Right. right. They don't care what you have to say, they're available to it. Yeah. They're not defensive. Yeah. They're not like, don't tell me my, thin is, my skin is thin, I can't hate yeah. it. I want to know, I want to know. Right. I'll never forget the highlight of my career was we were doing Sunday in the Park with George at Good Playwrights show. of Raisin Hill. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that is the piece. If somebody says to me, is there one thing in your whole career that defines something for you? It's that. And it's specifically what James Lapine wrote, which were the words, connect, George. Mm. Connect. Mm -hmm. That word is the word, the Bible word of my life. Yeah. My, my wish, my prayer, my desire to connect. And I could tell you a whole story about when we were playing, but I'll tell it real quick. So Steve was getting ready to write the part of Beautiful, uh, George's part of Beautiful. Yeah. He'd written the mother's part. And, uh, and he called me that night. We had a long conversation about our mothers and mm. sort of, you know, trying to connect and, and missing, you know, like yeah. ships in the night. And it was one of the more extraordinary conversations I'd ever had with any human being in my life, let alone about our mothers. Um, that were similar kinds of difficult journeys. And uh, three days later, he brought a poem of that conversation put to music. Wow. And it was his art, but I, I, ju I just got to be a little part of it. And I, I you know, it was, it was a thrill beyond, beyond words. Wow. And I also, I, I gave myself the impossible task once of figuring out the best Sondheim songs. And for me, Finishing the Hat is, is number one. And, and your performance of Finishing the Hat is just... Iconic. I mean, that, that song is oh. kind of says it all. I'll never forget the first moment I heard it, which was again across from Playwrights Horizon, uh, at the West Bank Cafe. Uh -huh. Underneath, they have that little piano yeah. bar. So Lapine and Stephen and Gemignani and I go downstairs. He wants it in that night. I'm gonna, he's going to play it for me like at noon or three o'clock. Wow. And we're going to do it that night in the in, in the workshop version where people were coming. And Stephen sits at the piano. And he begins. And by the time he finished, his, we were completely undone. Yeah. And kind of in a state of shock. And he was drenched. He came in dry. And he was drenched like a, from terror. Just, I would think it was some kind of fear that what if it isn't good enough? I, yeah. guess. I mean, why you sweat like that? Yeah. I don't know. But... I just don't know any people that are truly, truly gifted that don't, aren't, aren't afraid, aren't frightened, aren't yeah. fragile, aren't always saying, is it good enough? Have you sang that song recently? I, I sang it as we were filming one of the very last scenes of Homeland. Really? To Alex Gonza, I asked the director, when I finish this scene, could you just leave the camera rolling? Because I knew he was watching the monitor. Uh -huh. And he had told me repeatedly over the years, 
a story that where he first saw me and the reason I was in Homeland was when he saw Sunday in the Park with George that wow. that really affected his life. Uh -huh. And so there was a moment of a certain scene and it completely mirrored the song in my mind. And I just turned, you know, to the space and I, I sang it a cappella. Uh, and, and I was so nervous because I wanted to give him this gift that I had to start it three or four times because I couldn't remember the first few words. Because I haven't sung it in yeah. a long time. Yeah. But then I got it. And I got it. And uh, that was the last time I sang, which was about uh, right around October 3rd, 4th? Not long ago. Not long ago. That, that, what, a, what a beautiful gift. Thank God that was taped, that original Sunday in the Park with George for American Playhouse. Oh, yeah, 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 because yeah. I watched it endlessly. But the first time I saw you live was in Falsettos. You were oh. such a great Marvin in oh, Falsettos wow, yeah. on Broadway. You were so fantastic in that part. Oh, I love that piece. Heartbreaking. Yeah. And I love The Thank Wild you. Party, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I love The Wild Party. I guess I wondered if developing a new musical like The Wild Party, which for me was heartbreaking, so it was such a brilliant yeah. piece of theater. Yeah. I saw it like four times during that very brief run. Yeah. And Paradise Found, which, which yeah. didn't have a life. If that conflicted with your perfectionist side, trying to develop a new musical, and it, was that sort of a tricky balance? No. I, I mean, look, the, the perfectionist battle, God knows I had it in Sunday in the Park with George. You know, it, it, at times it did conflict. At times I... You know, at one moment I, I said, I, I'm leaving. Mm. This isn't for me. And James said, please, we're wow. doing this run through tonight. Have your wife and agent come. If they agree with you, you have my blessing wow. to go. Wow. And they came back. I gave, he said, just give it everything you got. I said, I will. I wasn't you because we were doing a workshop and people were coming and, and, and the part of the artist wasn't written. Just parts of it were written. Mm. And, and I just didn't know how to handle that. I was a young kid. And my wife and agent said, you're not leaving this under any circumstance. Wow. And, uh, well, please thank your wife tonight for that. I will. I will. <laughs> but I knew when it was, once, once I got over that, I was just terrified. You yeah. know, th this business of perfection, it's a, it's a bullshit word to me. Yeah. Because really what it means is frightened. Uh -huh. It's about fear. Yeah. And, and there's no one I admire that isn't afraid. Yeah. And if you're not, I'm not that interested of something. You know, <laughs> right. there's, you know, just the fragility of what we do. Yeah. And, and, and if you've tasted being lost in the moment, if you've tasted being there, if you've been present and, and got lost so you don't even remember what you just did, like life sometimes, yeah. it's an immediate addiction. Yeah. And so if it, if it isn't alive, the next time mm -hmm. you feel the lie mm -hmm. or, or, or I wasn't awake or I wasn't there for you. Mm -hmm. Not even how I did my part that I, I just wasn't listening. Yeah. Quiet and listening. Yeah. Your passion and your listening has, has developed so many amazing gifts for, for fans of yours over the years. And I'm just excited to see you on tour. And I know you have no plans to retire. And I'm excited to see what the heck Patty Lapone has cooked up. Yeah, she's got an interesting idea that, you know, Okay. we're, we're, we're going we're well, to figure it out. Please do it, yeah, and yeah. I can't wait to see what's next. And it's been such a pleasure to have you here. Been Thank a pleasure you so much. To be here. Thanks. And by the way, Children and Art, fantastic new album. That's a Sondheim song, by the way. And you play George and Marie in this version. That's right. That's I love right. that. I, I do I, I love that. It's such a great experience. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.